Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Huffman, Senior Vice President of Money Show, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a very special closing keynote today. Before I introduce our last speaker from our chair and CEO, Kim Gitzler, and the rest of our Money Show team, we hope you enjoy the program we've offered over the last few days, and it'll make a real difference in your investing and trading going forward. Please let us know what you thought of the show by sending us an email to customerrelations at moneyshow.com if you have any ideas for us. And after the show, remember you can watch a lot of these sessions uh, from the show when you log on to moneyshow.com. I'm delighted to introduce to you our closing speaker, a very special per person and a very popular speaker at all of our events, the founder and co-CEO of Tasty Trade, Mr. Tom Sosnoff. Tom is a renowned online brokerage innovator and a sought-after financial educator. He's a true visionary and a serial entrepreneur. He co-founded Thinkorswim in 1999, Tasty Trade in 2011, and launched Tasty Works in 2017. Leveraging over 20 years of experience as a market maker for the Chicago Board Options Exchange and one of the original OEX traders in the S&P 100 index pit, Tom pursued a vision to educate retail investors in option trading, build a superior software platform, and a brokerage firm that specialized in options. His efforts ultimately changed the way these instruments were traded by pioneering everything from single-click, complex trading functionality to multi-product access from a single platform. Currently, Tom is co-host of Chasty Trade Live and continues to drive innovation and know-how for the do-it-yourself investor. Tom has been named to Tech Week's Tech 100 list and Crane's Chicago Tech 50 list. He has spoken at Chicago Ideas Week, Tech Week Chicago, TD Ameritrade's Market Drive events, many of our Money Show and Traders Expo events, and at the University of Chicago's TEDx event, also the He Said, She Said tour for Tasty Trade. Tom received the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year of the Award in 2014, has been featured in prominent publications such as the Chicago Tribune, Crane Chicago, Traders Magazine, and Barron's. Please give a warm and hearty greeting to an amazing and brilliant man, Tom Sosnow. That's beautiful. Thanks. Cool. That never gets old. Um, everybody's so nice to me here. It's great. I, it's because I only come once a year, so it's awesome. I got off the plane today, and um, I didn't get to fly into Billy Bishop just because of the the, the uh, schedules. And and when I got the plane, I got outside. It was like a hundred degrees. <laughs> last time I was in, last time I was here for the film festival weekend, it was snowing. So I'm completely confused. I thought I was in Florida or something. Anyway, a little traffic. It's, it's crazy here, busy. Uh, I guess when the weather gets nice, everybody gets outside, and it was wild. We're letting the last few stragglers come on in here. And um, thanks so much for hanging out to the you know, end of the money show. Um, I'm the last speaker, and I love kind of the, the role of a cleanup hitter here. So it's awesome. So I'll let the last couple of people come in. How's the show been so far? Good? Good. I saw you had Gene Simmons here as the opening speaker, and I'm the closing speaker. That, to me, that seems the weirdest thing in all of finance. But uh, I, did, uh, um, I did the last uh, money show, uh, the last two money shows with, uh, with Gene in uh, Vegas and in San Francisco. In San Francisco, he dropped about 50 F-bombs. So we have a bet now. And he's going to be on our show uh, in a week from Monday in, in Chicago. So we have a bet over under. And I made the market four and a half, but we're not telling him. So we'll see what he says. But I kind of called it, it was supposed to be called Off the Record, but it turned into um, Off the Rails because I have no idea what he was talking about. But uh, he's, a, he's kind of a pretty interesting guy, so it'll be a, it'll be a fun interview. I'm actually going to create a portfolio. He doesn't know this because he's not watching this today, but I'm actually going to create a portfolio. So I'm going to let him you know, put his money where his mouth is, except it's going to be my money, his mouth. Uh, anyway, so that's going to be fun. So. I'm excited to, every year I'm always excited to be here because, as you've heard me talk about on air a lot, Toronto is like my, uh, we were talking about like which city would you pick to live in, and I know it's cold here and all the other crap, but I love this city. Um, I just hate the uh, Canadian regulators, um, and I hate the Canadian banks. 
I hate how difficult they make it so for you guys to trade, and especially for you to trade U.S. products. And trust me, um, I have I have heard you. Um, our second biggest audience in um, globally is in Canada. We have almost um, 10,000 people every day uh, throughout Canada that tune in to Tasty Trade. And we only have, um, we have we're, we're kind of a niche product. We have 100 and something thousand people that tune in over the course of the three loops we make all day on our show, which makes us a very small digital network in, in, you know, in the big picture when you compare us to you know, platforms like Facebook and Snapchat and all everything else. But when you talk about digital finance, we're the largest platform in the world. So it's the largest digital platform in the world that talks about strategy and finance, yet we're tiny. But there's still you know, 10,000 Canadians is huge. The next nearest country we have is only like 3,000 in, in Australia and Singapore and places like that. So it's, it's just awesome. Um, we just got, we started the licensing process for Tastyworks because I promised people an update. We started that licensing process for Tastyworks before last year's show here in September. And um, we started Australia and Canada at the same time. Australia, we're done and we're about to go live. And Canada, I have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm so, we're, we're in the, we're, 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 we're almost, I, I don't want to say we're on like the last couple of hurdles because I don't think it's the last couple of hurdles, but at least finally we can kind of, you know, we can't see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're in the tunnel somewhere, which, which is, which means we've committed too much money and there's no turning back. Um, we'll never break even in Canada, but we're going to, when we get here, we are going to totally, now we're mad, so we're going to totally disrupt this market no matter what it takes. So that I promise you. Anyway, talk to Trump. I don't think Trump will be talking to me anytime soon. Uh, I can think of a lot of people in this world that won't be talking to me. He's one of them. Uh, but, um, you know, we haven't got a lot of help in Canada from the, from the banks or the regulators, but you can understand that. We're, we're a disruptor. We, we, we're very competitive. We talk about products and strategies that are not that popular, um, you know, to the masses that people don't necessarily, you know, the idea of strategic finance is not something that is globally accepted. I mean, it's why, you know, we have really passionate um, we have really passionate viewers and passionate customers and passionate audiences, but, but on a relative basis, they're small. And it's because, you know, around the globe, strategic finance has not been widely accepted. We've been in a bull market now for, you know, since 2008. It's a solid 10 years. And it's difficult, you know, when you, when you look at passive returns and you look at active returns and you start thinking about, you know, is it worth the risk and things like that? You know, most people don't understand it. And especially they don't understand it in markets where, you know, um, one, of the, one of the issues we have in Canada is that the, the, there's not a huge amount of liquidity here, so there's not, um, there's not a local appetite. Anytime you move money outside of, outside of a country to go to another country to trade, it's not something that sits well with, you know, regulatory bodies. So that's our challenges. We've done it before, and we'll do it again, and I promise you, you're going to have an amazing piece of technology, and it's fast, it's stable. And it supports everything that we're going to talk about today, or everything I'm going to talk about today. I've got a, um, I've got a fairly aggressive presentation. Um, it is, it's about 50 minutes long, um, so we'll be done by you know by 5:30. Um, it is, it talks mostly about uh, you know U.S. markets and U.S. stocks and products, but but I feel like you know. I should be talking about liquidity more than anything else, and, th and that's the important thing to me. I want everybody in this room, and I've talked about this for years now coming up here, I want everybody to be to think strategically. I want you to build wealth through decision making. I want you to build wealth through strategy. I want you to build wealth through risk taking. And that's not something that most people talk about, and that's not something that the world's comfortable with. But there is a small group, there's a niche group of people globally you know, maybe a few hundred thousand, it may be a million people that can understand that and can see the benefits of it. And hopefully, you know, this discussion goes in that direction. I'm going to tell you a little story. I actually wrote, so when I left my house this morning, I've been on this crazy road schedule. I've been on the road for, um, uh, for eight straight weekends. And next weekend will be nine straight weekends, which I actually, I don't even mind. One of them was a vacation. I went to Sicily for, uh, for a week, which was, which was nice. And then the rest of all have been working. And this morning when I, when I took off, I, I started to write this, um, 
this, I call it a cherry bomb, but I started to write this video cherry bomb that I'm going to produce this week. And I wrote it about something that happened recently in the U.S., which is something I've been arguing about for a long time, and I thought I'd start off by just telling you. So a couple of years ago, the, the regulators, because I've been on this bashing regulator kick, the regulators decided in the U.S., the SEC and um, FINRA, decided that they would widen the markets on small cap stocks. Now, the reason this is applicable in Canada is that Canada has a lot of you know, um, small caps, the equivalent of small cap stocks. So they decided they'd widen the markets in small cap stocks, 1,200 stocks to be exact. Now, when you think about this for a second, you know, we're, we've, we've spent years getting into penny-wide markets because the way you build an economy and the way you build businesses and entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is, is through creating a marketplace where both the risk takers can monetize it and the people, the visionaries, can also monetize it. So the people that want to bet on somebody and the people that are actually betting on themselves, they can both monetize it. And through that comes this incredible opportunity or incredible you know, opportunities. So in the small cap world, the large institutions in the US and the large financial institutions, now we're talking about everybody from like you know, BlackRock, Fidelity, um, it, it, all the big firms that manage lots of money, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, everybody else, they decided that the markets were too thin, being penny wide, and they wanted depth of market in small cap stocks. So they widened all the markets on a pilot program to a, nickel, to a minimum of a nickel wide. So they took all, all the penny markets out of the way and went to a nickel wide. Now, what's interesting about this is, again, it was a pilot program. So we ranted about this and said, this is ridiculous. You never move backwards. You never slow up systems, which is why I don't like new exchanges that have that, that, um, that have hurdles in them. I don't like anybody that slows anything down. They widened the markets out on 1,200 stocks, and they thought that it would present additional liquidity and let big institutions have depth and size. After the program ran for two years, they just realized, after doing studies, that not only did it not work, but it cost individual investors $900 million. So the article in the Wall Street Journal and article in Barron's showing that there was a $900 million that small investors paid to trade these stocks because the markets were wider than they had been you know, in previous years. So they're abandoning the program, getting rid of it, canceling, and go back to penny-wide markets. Now, three years ago, we wrote comment letters to the SEC. We wrote comment letters to, um, to all the regulators, and we said, this is the dumbest idea that I don't know who thought of this, but whoever thought of it doesn't understand what's going on. And the small investor is going to pay for this pilot program. Well, the small investor paid $900 million. The institutions lost nothing. My argument has always been that let's go to the most competitive marketplace. So our technology doesn't even route directly to exchanges. And this is what kind of freaks people out sometimes. Our technology routes to liquidity providers who in turn compete for order flow because then customers get price improvement, they get competitive markets, they get tighter bid ask spreads, they get better technology, and they get reduced commissions. We argued this in front of the regulators and we're arguing this now in front of the Canadian regulators. It's the same exact thing. We're arguing that the lack of high frequency market making, the lack of arbitrage, the lack of players to make markets to create an impetive, competitive environment and take it away from the exchanges that essentially charge too much for data and too much for fees and give it back to the customers and let you trade is the biggest challenge. Well, finally, with this rollback of this program, they've, the argument that, the, that these institutions have made over the years has been proven that you know, it doesn't work and the customer will now hopefully benefit in the future. And I'm hoping that that, that, that kind of met, that methodology and that approach you know, applies here. One of the problems we have in Canada is that it's hard to trade Canadian products because the exchange data fees are so expensive and the clearing costs are so expensive. So to get rates down, you know, in order for customers to be successful, and I'm a customer just like you, in order for customers to be successful, you have to have really low rates because you have to be 
able to compete in a level playing field. In order to have low rates, you have to be able to execute efficient markets that are liquid, and you have to have very low clearing rates. They don't have that here currently. And in order to get that, you know, there has to be added value. You have to have added liquidity, and you also have to have, you know, new technology. And so we're hoping that our move to Canada will at least push everything in that direction, and we'll get there sooner than later. But I thought it was an interesting story because we're starting to see now the message that we've been sending, the strategic message about competitive markets and about marketplace efficiency is finally starting to take hold. And it's really interesting. So I have a discussion for you today that covers lots of different topics. It's, it's pretty fast paced. And after I'm done with this, I probably will distribute this, this presentation to people that want it. I just got to wait about a week or two um, because I have a couple of more, um, uh, I have to use parts of this for, for another couple of events I have coming up in the next week or two. And after that, you know, if you email me, I can send it to you. My email is tom at tastytrade.com. So I'm Chicago based, um, which is a short flight from here, which is awesome. Uh, our company has, just to give you a little background, especially if you're new, we have a company that we built. We started this company seven years ago, almost eight years ago now. It's called Tasty Trade. We own a company called Tasty Works. We own a company called The Quiet Foundation, which we're about to launch. And we own a couple of really cool companies, which we're going to tell you about in the next couple of months that you will be able to participate in that is going to change the way you think about finance. So um, we are about 120 people. We have two offices in Chicago. If you ever get to Chicago, we have uh, some fun studios. We have an open door policy. You can come in, you can kick the tires, you can check us out. and. Uh, um, and we travel a lot, so we get, hopefully we'll get to lots of cities. And if we get licensed, we'll be here next year, and we can actually come and do events like this. So we're excited about that. So my presentation today covers lots of different bases. But basically, I'm going to talk about, let me just figure out where i got to aim. Oh, i go backwards. Okay. I think this is the start. Yeah. So there is an unequal distribution of wealth in the US. Now, I think there's an unequal distribution of wealth in almost every country in the world. I just don't have statistics from everywhere else. So I don't think this is native to the US. But there's an unequal distribution of wealth because we've been in this crazy bull market. I shouldn't say crazy. We were, a better way to put it is, we were grossly oversold. I don't know how many people in this room were trading in 2000. In 2000, in 2000, 2001, and in 2007, 2008. But 2008 was a meltdown. 2008, the market lost, you know, um, the market lost, let's call it 65% of its value, almost 70% of its value in the S&Ps. In 2001, the NASDAQ, between 2001 and 2002, lost almost 84% of its value. So crazy numbers in, in very strong meltdowns over the years. And because of that, the stronger the sell-off, you know, the stronger the bounce back. And so what you've seen here is the longest bull market in history. But in the process of that, there has been an incredible, um, uneven distribution of wealth. The top 1% own over one half the country's wealth, and it's not that much different in every other country around the globe that we've looked at. But that's the most of any industrial country. So that share is also higher than it's been at any point we think in history, but the data we have only goes back to 1962. So in the US right now, the wealthiest 1% captured 95% of the post-financial crisis gains. And we start to think about that, you're like, wow, that's really, uh, that's a concentrated, that's a, that's a huge amount of money to a very small, concentrated group of wealthy individuals. Now, on, the, on paper, I don't have a, pro I, I understand that. I shouldn't say I have a problem with it. I understand it. But what concerns me is anytime you have a concentration of assets and a concentration of wealth and a concentration of growth like that, then there's other issues that are correlated to that, which we'll get into. So BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, and seven other firms currently manage over $1 trillion in assets each. Now, remember, 1998 was the long-term capital management meltdown, and they've written you know, books about it, and, and it almost took the market down. Um, we were trading in the pits back in 1998, and it was a scary, scary time. It was a $3 billion meltdown, $3 billion. Now we're talking about 
you know, over 10 firms that are managing over a trillion dollars in assets. So why is that concerning? Well, it's concerning because that's a concentration of huge amounts of global wealth in the hands of just a few people. And you're talking about that wealth also being concentrated just a few people. BlackRock alone has $6 trillion in managed assets. $6 trillion. CEO of BlackRock, when we built our last firm, the CEO of BlackRock was, uh, was a buddy of one of the guys on our board of directors. And um, my, my, my buddy said, you know, I gave Larry Fink his job, so um, if you'd like to talk to him, I think he'd be interested in looking at your software. Um, so I go, sure, have him call me. So this guy calls me up, he goes, it's Larry Fink. I go, hey, what's going on, Larry? Uh, and he goes, who are you? I told him who I was, and he goes, he goes what do you do? I said, you know, we build this, this derivative software, you can trade options on it, you can trade stock, you can trade futures. He goes, he goes, truthfully, kid, I got no effing interest, and hang up the phone. <laughs> that, was, that was my entire conversation with Larry Fink in, in 2003. I think at the time they were managing about, I want to say three or 400, um, maybe, Two or three hundred billion dollars. They're up to six trillion dollars. All the physical cash in the world is just over seven trillion dollars. So, so and that's not the value of everything in the world. That's just all the physical cash in the world is seven trillion. BlackRock is almost managing seven trillion dollars. Now, again, the concern here is not that the, the, those numbers on their own don't mean that much. It's the concentration of management. Don't think there's that many people managing those six or seven trillion dollars. That's the scary part. You've got six trillion dollars being managed by one company. You've got seven trillion dollars of physical cash in the entire world. And the people that manage it, it's a small little group. So what happens is there's a risk out there. There's a risk that there is a very small number of firms managing a ridiculous amount of money. In total, it's up in the, let's call it in the $20 trillion range, managed by less than 20 people. When you start to think about global wealth, and you start to think about, you know, just two years ago, the US GDP was $20 trillion. You've got 20 people managing $20 trillion at less than 10 firms. It's a concentration of wealth that means absolutely nothing today because we're in a 10-year bull market. But it's a concentration of wealth that should say to everybody, hey, you know what? I'm really happy that I'm managing my own money because if somebody else is managing my money, they're not going to care about my money being the first one out if some of this stuff changes. You just have to think about that. You have to think about where's your money in the queue? And it's not going to be at the front of the queue when this thing rolls over. So none of the market leaders in 1987 were still at the top in 2001. I'm not sure how many people in this room were investing or trading in 1987, but I was. I traded the crash of 19. I started. I started in this business in 1980, and in the crash of 1987, you know, I was just a floor trader like a few thousand other people, and and I don't even remember the companies that led the market in 2000. I'm sorry, 1987, but it was companies like Eastman Kodak, which isn't really even around anymore. It was IBM, which hasn't moved in so many years. It was General Motors. It was that group of kind of the, the uh, old kind of blue chips that they used to say. Those were the kind of the kings in 1987. By 2001, it was a whole different group of stocks. It was Cisco. It was Oracle. It was um, Exxon. It was to a certain extent, Microsoft, there was a couple other companies there. There were five companies, it was Intel, that reached a half a $500 billion or a half a trillion dollars by, 2000, by March of 2000, April of 2000. None of those companies in 2000 were market leaders in 2018. So 1987 to 2001, there was a complete you know, changeover. 2001 to 2018, another complete changeover. The disruption cycle, which is where I'm getting to on this, the disruption cycle now is significantly shorter. And it's, and it's, it, if you go back and you look at companies that started in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s, 
the disruption cycle was 20, 30, 40 years. The disruption cycle right now is tiny, and it's only going to get shorter. The disruption cycle, as technology gets cheaper, the disruption cycle is going to narrow. And it's almost impossible for markets you know, not to, to disrupt. It's almost impossible for stocks. It's almost impossible for markets not to disrupt. It's just, just look, 87 to 2000, it's a, it's none of the companies from 87 were market leaders in 2000. None of the companies in 2000 are market leaders in 2017, 2018. So it's reasonable to assume that based on everything we know today, and we know about cycles and disruption and the way companies change, it's reasonable to assume that today's narrow group of market leaders and when we talk about narrow, we're talking about concentration. So you have this massive concentration of wealth. You have this massive concentration of decision making. And then you have this massive concentration of just a few companies that have crazy valuations. It's very fair to assume that none of that will be in place by 2030. Now, 2030 is 12 years away. But lots of stuff happens in the interim. So why are trillions of dollars flowing into just a handful of companies. Are we being short-sighted like we were in 87? Are we being short-sighted like we were in 2000? It seems that greed is winning over common sense, but there's no way, ultimately, to change gravity. So, here's my questions to you. Would you rather own Amazon, that's the market cap of Amazon, which is, let's call it a trillion dollars, at $1,900, which I think is where it closed right around on Friday. Or you could buy all the outstanding shares of the Spiders, the Qs, IWM, the entire float of all the diamonds, and you still have enough cash left over to do it all again. <laughs> There's always that guy. <laughs> There's always that guy. I mean, I mean, just think how nuts that is. So you can buy every single of the four major ETFs and buy them twice, and you own the entire float of it all, or you can own Amazon. This just seems to me, it seems crazy. But I'll show you more. So would you rather own Google, where it closed at $1,175, or all the silver ever mined in human history? I'm just showing you where these companies are valued now because it scares the crap out of me. Would you rather own Facebook at 166 bucks or own every professional sports franchise and every television network in the world? It's kind of nuts. Facebook, you said? There you go. There's always two of you. <laughs> Would you rather own Baba, which is a Chinese, which is a Chinese stock, at 165 dollars, or you can buy every share? of every Chinese ETF 50 times over. I, I'm just showing you the valuations. People have lost their minds. Would you rather own Netflix at $365? That means the whole company. You can buy it out right now with no premium. Or every movie ever made. We're going to sell the entire arts. We're going to sell <laughs> centuries of arts for Netflix. It seems, it just seems, it blows my mind. Or, here's the killer. Would you rather own Apple or you own the entire GDP of Russia? <laughs> that is where Apple's trading right now, by the way. Equivalent to the GDP of Russia. It's Apple at 225. Now, again, when you think about the concentration of wealth, of decision making, of these few narrow stocks. I mean, I just showed you five stocks with a market value of close to $5 trillion. Five stocks with $5 trillion in market cap. I mean, I know there's people out here, and because, because when I got in this business, um, a, company that had, a company that had $100 million market cap was huge. I think, G. I I think, I want to say, well, I remember when Apple went public, and I want to say I remember when they, they borrowed in the mid-90s $50 million just to stay in business. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. I mean, in 2001, we kind of thought Apple had a chance of going out of business. Um, 
a, a, our CTO, who is an Apple freak, he loves, loves he's been, lo I've known him for 19 years. His name is Woody Ma. He started working, um, he started building our last company, he's still our CTO today. Um, he started working for me in the middle of 1999. And all he, he never made a trade before. All he ever wanted to do was buy Apple. And so, the, and because he just loved Apple, he loved everything about Apple. And the first trade he ever made was when we built our last platform, he sold naked puts in Apple at 12 and a half. And um, he, sold, he sold the 10 puts when Apple was trading 12 and a half. And he said to me, what do you think? And I said, you're going to get killed. <laughs> I don't think Apple ever traded under 12 and a half again in, in history. He's done quite well um, buying Apple. My first trade in Amazon goes back to about 1995. And I walked into an, the Amazon pit where it just started trading. And it was, it was basically an online bookstore at the time. And the stock was trading at $7.60. And I sold the seven and a half puts. And I sold way too many of them. And I spent the next probably three days trying to scratch the trade. I think that was the all-time low in Amazon. So if you remember, it's seven and a half. So anyway, BlackRock, Fidelity, and Vanguard controlled $11 trillion of passive investments, which happens to be just about the GDP of China. You, just, you, you, know, you know what you read. You, you read the news every day, and they, you talk about, you know, this tariff and this collusion and this, you know, maybe they don't talk about it here in Canada, but we talk about it in the U.S. And, and everything, and, and they start mentioning countries. But it's very hard to get perspective to know that the GDP of, of Russia is equal to Apple. Or that these three companies, BlackRock, Fidelity, and Vanguard, control more money than the GDP of China. Yes. So it's just interesting, again, because you know what? Nobody talks about this stuff. I, I think in five years they may say, hey, you know what? There was, a pretty, there was a pretty nasty red flag up there, but we didn't see it. So what about stock market experts? What if there's no such thing? I am, um, it's taken me a really long time to embrace, you know, it took me 20 years of trading to get to, to get to the point where I wanted to build really cool technology. It took me 10 years of building cool technology to get to the point where I wanted to build really cool content. And it took me three years of building really cool content to believe in my own research. Um, we built a think tank for the purpose of, um, of changing the way we approach trading and investing so that we could build a math model that would change the way hundreds of thousands of customers and viewers looked at investing because we couldn't stand the fact that all that was out there was fundamental and technical analysis. There had to be something that was mathematical. There couldn't be, if you believe in efficient market theory and you believe that prices are efficient, then there couldn't be an edge based on somebody knowing something. And then I went back and looked at at all the great traders I've ever known and all the great trading firms I've ever known, and I realized they, their edge was that they didn't believe there was an edge for everybody else. And I figured, how can we do this on a customer level? So the so-called experts in this industry, wherever it is, in the media, whatever it could be, they repeat worthless catchphrases. I once heard Warren Buffett say, discuss a market sell-off, and his advice was, hey, try to keep a level head. Now, that's cool if you're a passive investor because you don't even know what your money's invested in anyway, so it's easy to keep a level head because you don't know what anybody's done with your money. You just know that in a certain number of years, you're supposed to get back more than you put in, but you don't know what happens in the process. And most people don't want to know. That's the whole reason they're passive. I once heard an executive, when I say I heard, I read this, at a very successful robo-advisor recommend to investors that when the market sells off and investors get nervous, just go rewatch your favorite Super Bowl commercials. That's a reasonable thing. You know, I've heard people say, go, go to sleep for 20 years. Do whatever you have to do. Get ice cream with your kids if you want to. Have you ever got ice cream with your kids? It's not fun. Uh, <laughs> at least it wasn't with my kids. Um, as long as you're invested appropriately for your goals, you know, just stay away. I've heard lots of people from from Jack Bogle to everybody else talking about the same stuff. Just wake up in 20 years. 
You know what drives me crazy about that is not the fact that just when you wake up in 20 years, you're 20 years older and, and you haven't learned anything, but it's not just about you haven't learned anything about finance. You haven't learned anything about risk taking. You haven't learned anything about decision making. You think the people that are outliers, do you think the people that are ridiculously successful, do you think that people get to a certain point in business, in their careers, and in whatever they're doing because, because they don't take risk and they don't make decisions and they don't, they, do some, they don't do something very different than everybody else? The most brilliant entrepreneurs are the most brilliant risk takers, are the ones who can assess risk. And the way you learn how to assess risk is you make decisions. The way you learn how to make decisions is strategic. And the only pl level playing field for strategic decision making are the financial markets. Because the bid ask differential is so narrow that you can actually play and play with a small amount of money. So how do you know if you're invested properly for your goals if you've never done anything, if you haven't made decisions? You can't know. How do you know when it's time to invest? It's easy to say buy low, sell high. You ever try to buy low? It's freaking impossible. You ever try to sell high? Nobody's ever done it before. Except me, it doesn't work all the time. But, but it's not easy. How do you know when it's time to sell? Well, if you don't know when it's time to buy, you for sure don't know when it's time to sell. That's why nobody ever sells. How do you learn about diversification? It's not possible to learn about diversification if you don't play the game. It's just not possible. You cannot sit on the sidelines. It's not like a video game. It's not something you can learn. You cannot understand what true diversification is until there are difficult markets and you learn about you know, being product agnostic and positions that are non-correlated. It's not possible to learn about true diversification. Nobody realizes how tightly correlated their ETF portfolio is. You are not diversified if you are long the NASDAQ and you are long the Dow. You are not diversified if you are long the UK, Canada, and the US stock market. You are not diversified if you're long China and long the US stock market. Those are not diversification plays. Those are all long equity plays. And to go back and look at what's happened in the bond market globally over the last 10 years, you can see the same thing. When we went to zero rates here, we went to zero rates in Germany, we went to zero rates in Japan, we went to zero rates, basically zero rates everywhere in the world. So there's no diversification in that sense. Diversification comes from understanding that there are different strategies you can use. That's true diversification. Strategic diversification is actually as valuable as product diversification. Product diversification, strategic diversification, duration diversification. People that don't trade multiple products do not understand the difference between any of those. And here's the other thing. There are very few people that could sit through this lecture today, and there are very few people that could articulate even some of the points. I try to give takeaways every couple of minutes. And there are very few people that can use some of those takeaways to explain this to anybody else. It is extremely complex when you get out into the public. It's easy for you and extremely complex for the public when it comes to investing to understand any of the nuances. It's nuts. How do you learn about strategy if you don't actually trade? My argument to the regulators was, make a trade. Make a trade and your entire opinion about limiting the amount of liquidity and products individuals. In Canada, you cannot trade in your, in your um, RRSP account. Um, you cannot trade in your retirement account any kind of derivative strategies. You know what? No regular has ever tried that. So they don't understand that, or no trustee has ever tried that before, so they don't get the fact that, hey, it's okay to reduce cost basis. Hey, it's okay to give, your, to give individuals an opportunity to be strategic. My argument is, we've used this argument too on when it comes to media. You know, at the Wall Street Journal, nobody's allowed to trade. At CNBC, nobody's allowed to trade. At Bloomberg, you can't trade. I hired Dylan Radigan three years ago to, and he, 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 just, he, he was working for us up until he ran for Congress this year. And we're still very close friends. Dylan ran the, um, uh, the he was the youngest uh, head of the Bloomberg trade desk. And he, he wrote the CNBC Fast Money program. That was his idea. And he, he was the, the head of it, the anchor, whatever you want to call it. Um, he was the top talking head. When we hired him, he'd never made a trade. I'm like, dude, you would talk about trading all day long. You talk about it on the air for seven freaking years. What do you mean you never made a trade? He's like, well, we weren't allowed to trade, so I never made a trade. 
did I just say that out loud? And I'm like, it blew my mind. Because I'm like, of course you don't understand what we do here. Because you've never done this before. And it's, I understand it's not for everybody. I get that. But the, the thing that people don't get from it is every time you do something, however small it is, and at the minimum quantity or whatever it is, it changes the way you think and everything else that you do for the rest of your career has nothing to do with trading, has nothing to do with investing. It changes the way you assess risk. It changes the way you make decisions. It changes the way you think about making decisions. It changes the speed at which you make decisions. And for most people, of course, it's not for everybody, but for most people who fall inside the curve, it helps to build wealth. For the people that get outside the curve on the positive side, it creates outlier wealth. For the people that fail at it, which is, which is going to happen, it takes away wealth. But for the majority of people inside the curve, which is the 68% of the people inside the distribution curve and the 16% at the other end, okay, for that 84%, there's a positive outcome. And that's too big a risk not to take. So how do you learn about different products? How do you learn about different markets? Well, you can't if you don't do it. How do you improve your chances of success? If you're not strategic, it is not possible to improve your chance of success. If you don't understand what it means to improve your probability of success, then it's not possible to do it. I talk to people and I say, how do you improve your chance of success? Outside of the world of Tasty Trade and a few other places, Nobody can answer that question. Go ask a money manager, any money manager, how do you improve your chance of success? And the first thing they say is, well, you know, we got really good analysts. I'm like, so? How does that improve your chance of success? Well, they're right. I go, yeah, right. That's the dumbest answer I've ever heard. I mean, give, you know, it's amazing that in a, there's a million stockbrokers and, and registered investment advisors in North America. Um, over a million, like 1.2 million. And the fact that only a few of you, basically everybody in this room and then beyond, can answer this question, how do you improve your chance of success? How do you lower your basis? How do you improve your chance of success using different products? It's something they should teach in third grade. But it's something that, unfortunately, we don't learn until we're 50. What if the market doesn't bounce back? It's really easy when you just buy every dip. But what if the market doesn't buy bounce back. And what do you do with new monies? How do you introduce new monies and new strategies? And how do you think about that? You know, it's crazy that we spend so much of our lives thinking about all this stuff, but when it comes to finance, we're like, no, oh, somebody else will take care of this. But the person that you've, you've decided can take care of this, it's not, it's not the right person. Like when you go to the doctor, you choose the right person because this person has, is, has an expert. When you choose somebody, if, if you can't fly a plane, you choose somebody that knows how to fly a plane because that person's an expert. But when you choose somebody to manage your money that doesn't understand any of the strategies and is just an asset gatherer, that's really scary. So what if you realize you know more than your advisor, more than the talking heads, more than the expert newsletter writer? Well, what happens when that light bulb goes off, when you finally realize, oh my God, you know what? I know more than this person. It blew my mind when we built our last company. We were a public company, and we were in the financial service space. And I had my first, I had my first um, like meeting with a bunch of CEOs in the at running all these you know fifty hundred billion dollar companies. And I sat in a room, and I'm like, oh my god, nobody in this room knows anything. <laughs> I mean, they're smart people. They all graduated from Wharton and Yale and Princeton and everything else. I don't think anybody here has ever made a trade. I don't think anybody here has ever seen a piece of software. I don't think anybody here knows what one single market does. I don't think they know. They have 5 million customers. They have 4 million customers. I think I was at a Citigroup meeting once, and they had like 11 million customers. And I said to myself, I don't think that a single person at this table has any idea what any one of these customers do with their money. It blew my mind. And I had this moment where I said, what if you realize you know more than everybody else in this room, at least about your business? And, and I kind of think it's the same way now with, with individual investors. We're able to produce content at a rate and at a level that 
blows away. Like, like I always say this on air, and people think I'm, I'm joking around, but, but I'm not. There's 100,000 people out there that understand this business better than 1.2 million so-called professionals. And when they don't understand it better, they understand it tenfold better. And it's really scary. So what do you do if your portfolio doesn't grow? Like these are all questions you have to ask yourself in a passive world. What about learning to take risk and making financial decisions? These are, these are very difficult for most people. This is what the passive world struggles with all the time. You cannot break out of that cycle. And by the way, I don't like, I hate investor education because I think it's all bullshit. I think it's like teaching somebody, I think it's like teaching, it's like a casino teaching you how to play blackjack. Doesn't mean anything to me. What I like is strategy. I don't want the casino to tell me how to play craps because I know I can't win. And that's why over the years, most investor education, that's why, that's why most investors are not successful because investor education doesn't make any sense. What we're doing now is we are creating strategic, a, a strategic context. And strategic context where there's a math model behind it, where there's something quantitative, something statistical, something probabilistic, is incredibly empowering. Because at some point, you don't need me. It all makes sense. And then for every risk that you take, you can justify it on your own. You can say, hey, you know what? You know what drives me, what always drove me crazy about this business is, is somebody give money to somebody gives money to somebody else. And if they make money for you, they're a genius. And if they lose money for you, they're an idiot. But you have no idea what they did in the process, so it doesn't really matter. What I love about what we're doing is we're empowering individuals to make their own decisions based on math and strategy. And ultimately what happens is if you lose money, you blame yourself. And if you make money, you take credit for it. And that's the way it should be. Because that's real entrepreneurship. That's real business. Catchy one-liners that sound good are meaningless. What's worse are so are the firms that promote that nonsense. So I'm going to talk about our influence a little bit. Bull markets make dumb people look smart, and they make rational people seem crazy. This is how I justify my own existence. <laughs> Consider myself a rational person, and I think I've been, I seem crazy lately. But if markets are truly random, then it's all just a giant math equation that will eventually normalize itself, and that's why I'm a little bit of a pot odds freak. What I mean by that is I play opportunity based on what I, my perceived pot odds are. If I'm going to be directional, I'm going to be directional knowing that I don't know what's going to happen next, but thinking that if I'm right, my reward is greater than my risk. And that's something about you know, just appreciating the fact that markets are random and that somewhere along the line, there's, if, if there's a math equation, it will normalize. So that doesn't mean everything's mean reverting. It just means that the math aspect of it's mean reverting. Price is not mean reverting. So crazy people somehow become geniuses, and the smart people go back to being clueless at some point. And that's my goal for everybody in this room and for everybody that we talk to, is that when markets become more opportunistic and they're not one-dimensional, that all of us that we were thinking, man, I spent a lot of time trying to learn all this stuff, and next thing you know, we go from being crazy to genius status. And everybody else goes back to just being normal, wondering what the hell are we doing. So mean reversion, when it comes to math equations, it's a beautiful thing. And it's something that gets us excited because we know, for example, like with respect to implied volatility, which is a measure of fear, it's a mean reverting equation. Price, on the other hand, is not. And so we've got that out of our heads. We don't think it is anymore. So here are some of my suggestions for succeeding in an opportunistic marketplace. Let me just make sure my time's good. It is. Okay. So first, don't be afraid of heightened implied volatility. It's a gift, not a curse. Heightened implied volatility simply means that expected move is greater than it was before. So if the stock, if XYZ stock was supposed to move $10 next month, and now it's supposed to move $20 because there's fear and excitement, it's an opportunity. It's not a curse. It's an opportunity. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. 
Somebody asked me, I did an interview with a very nice woman in the other room who asked me really good questions because she studied some of the stuff we talk about. And one of her questions was, what do you like here? And I said, what do you mean, what do I like? She said, like, you know, what do you like? What are some of the plays that you're doing right now? And I said, well, we like underlyings with heightened volatility. She said, like what? So I said, well, one of the stocks right now that's interesting is Tesla, because Tesla has an implied volatility rank of 90. It has, when you measure its implied volatility against itself, its expected move is in the 90, 90 something percentile of its last 12 months. To me, that means opportunity. My directional bet right now in Tesla is zero. So my deltas are zero. I have no longs and no shorts, but it's my largest position because it's all short premium because I believe that the opportunity in Tesla right now, as it presents itself based on expected move and heightened implied volatility, is the best out there. She said, well, what if it's not Tesla because that may be too risky for some people? So another stock we have a position on right now is EWZ, which is a Brazilian e ETF, which is a 30, 30 $31 stock. It's a $31 stock that's trading with 100% implied volatility rank. So over the last year, it's at its highest point in implied volatility because of upcoming elections in Brazil. But it's a $31 stock. So if you don't want to play with a $300 stock, you can play with a $30 stock. Again, the beautiful thing about markets are that there is always an opportunity somewhere. And with that opportunity, based on different prices, you can risk one-tenth of the capital in EWZ than it would take to risk in in Tesla, but those are my two biggest positions. And I explained that. Now, nobody else would in the, in the world of finance would ever say their two biggest positions are based on implied volatility. So we love heightened volatility. Strategy diversification is just as important to, as product diversification, and that's one of the reasons that we build our own technology. It's later. I'll get to it later. One of the reasons we love building technology is so that we can, so we can create the vehicle for scaling this discussion. Everything we talk about today, I want it to be one click or actually less. The ability to click into something, roll into something, add a trade, take away a trade, and then we eliminated, which you'll have soon in Canada, all closing commissions. So that way, you put something on, it costs nothing to take it off, so you can manage your winners, so you can adjust your trades. We've learned over time that staying small, we can't, I can't believe I missed this for 35 years, but staying small is one of the real keys to trading success. It's one of the real keys to decision-making success. Realize now that throughout my career especially, we always were too big, too much ego, too much, too much what we felt was immediate opportunity. The real thing is, if you aggressively manage your winners, you aggressively manage your position risk, and you stay small enough, you can control all that decision making with a reasonable, with reasonable, we call it standard deviation of risk, reasonable amount, well, amount of fluctuation in your account. If you keep your decay numbers, which answers your question about volatility, if you keep your decay numbers positive, which means the marketplace is always working for you, which we're trying to get every single investor in America to understand, and in Canada, that when you have positions on, there should be something that offsets that position to either reduce some of the risk, flatten out your risk curve, or at the same time, generate return for you on a daily basis. We call it, it's the don't get hit by a bus trade. So every single thing that you do, every single day that goes by, there's a little bit of added premium decay that supports what you're trying to accomplish, which is building wealth. Most important thing, I see you afterwards. Most important thing is liquidity rules. So in order for us to be able to do all this stuff that we're talking about today, we need liquidity. One of the limitations here in Canada is that the local markets, especially the option markets, uh, um, there just isn't the liquidity you need in order to be successful trading those markets. Something maybe will change. Somebody asked me before, in the next 10 years, Tom, in the next 10 years, Tom, do you see liquidity changing in Canada? And I'm like, if if we if the Canadian regulators can attract high frequency firms to come here and make markets, 
because the public's participating, and if the legacy backends are replaced with new technology, maybe it's blockchain, maybe it's not, but whatever it is, so that the cost structure comes down, then you can have tight markets. Until we create that competitive environment, you know what, we have to go where there's liquidity. The problem around the globe right now, and I wish there was more liquidity around the globe, the problem around the globe right now is the only liquid, true liquid markets for individual investors to trade in are in the US. You can't go to China, you can't go to Singapore, you can't go to Germany, you can't go to the UK, you can't go to India. They just don't have the liquid derivatives markets which allow for strategies. Remember, there's a bunch of different things you can do. The reason Bitcoin and digital currencies were so popular is that they were pure asset speculation. But the problem with asset speculation is as soon as the bubble pops, the game's over. And the bubble pops, so the game's over. Because there's no strategy. Asset speculation, it means that you bet on something to go up or down. Digital currencies were a pure up or down bet. Stocks are a pure up or down bet. Futures are a pure up or down bet. But when you add other derivatives to that approach and other strategy like maybe it's options, maybe it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's one product against another product, which is the pairs trade or whatever else it is. As soon as you add strategy to that, everything changes. And so in order to do that though, you need liquidity because you can't give up theoretical edge to the street. So manage your capital efficiency. It's one of the most important things that we've learned over the last 10 years is managing capital efficiency was something we've never had to do before, but now we realize how effective it is and be product indifferent. It doesn't matter what you trade. They're all the same. Every product's the same, whether it's a future, whether it's, a, whether it's a, any kind of commodity, whether it's any kind of stock, whatever it is, they're all the same. Because all pricing is efficient because there's too much money out there right now chasing too small returns. That's one of the things we like to say, we like to say brains over bots. Do you know why? Because if there was an opportunity for robotic trading and for artificial intelligence to take over and machine learning to take over trading, then there'd be lots and lots of billionaires. Instead, there's lots and lots of people spending billions of dollars because you can't, you can't make money from an efficient marketplace. It's crazy, but in order for AI to work, in order for artificial intelligence and machine learning to work, you need inefficiencies. If you have markets that are one penny wide, take Apple for example, it's a, it's a $225 stock with penny wide markets. How can, there's zero inefficiency in there. So how can a robot or how can any kind of machine learning take advantage of that strategically? It's not possible. That's what I love about this business, so it's brains. So it's all about product indifference, it's all about strategy. Don't hesitate to adjust because today, I know it's still a little expensive in Canada, but it's getting cheaper and when we get here, it'll be a lot cheaper, but the transaction costs have come way down. So don't hesitate to adjust and there's no such thing anymore as over trading. It's a thing of the past because in order to be successful, you have to make lots of decisions. In order to make lots of decisions, you've got to be participating in lots of different underlyings. Take advantage of real opportunity. That's when the implied volatility rank, which is something we watch every second, goes up over a certain number. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 75, maybe it's 35, whatever it is. Lean more towards ETFs and indexes when implied volatility is high because there's simply more opportunity. Again, implied volatility is just another word for expected move. When the expected move is rich, that's when there's opportunity. You don't have a greater success rate when there's opportun more opportunity. You make more money. That's the biggest confusion people have. You're not more successful because there's more expected move. In other words, your probability of success doesn't go from 50 to 90. If your probability of success was 90, in higher implied volatility, your probability of success is still 90. The difference is instead of making a dollar, you make $2. And that makes up for a lot of other trades. Keep your available capital, if you're active, to, a, to at least 40% available because, that's, because what we've learned is it's really important to keep some powder dry. It's really important to keep some cash. It's really important to be able to take advantage of opportunities regardless of markets. Staying active in volatile markets is a real confidence builder. It's really important. If you can do something, you know, if you've, if you've ever played a sport or... Um, or I'm just thinking of like a crazy golf game in the middle of a rainstorm. If you have your best round when it's raining, you build confidence. If you're, if you're doing something when it's the most difficult time, 
if you're building a business in the middle of a recession, or you're doing something when, the mar- when everything's against you and you pull it off, it's a confidence builder. So it's all good. If financial opportunity was obvious and obvious worked, everyone would be filthy rich. I love saying this. Fortunately, though, obvious does not work. And those who can stand to the side, kind of stand alone when the herd comes charging by, will ultimately benefit the most. Here's what we know. Tax cuts, and I'm talking about U.S. markets right now, tax cuts have led to buybacks, which have led to an earnings boost, which have pushed us to all-time highs. This is, when I say this is what we know, this is what they talk about in media. This is not what I know. Global growth looks great. The world's a great place, I think. The world's an almost great place. Okay. Inflation remains at bay, and that's pretty fair. And the U.S. dollar is really strong against, you know, most other global currencies right now. These are what we call, these are Tomisms. These are masters of the obvious. Amazon is taking over the world. Pretty much everything. Every, I mean, who would have thunk? Um, I think it was two and a half years ago, Amazon was trading for about $250 billion. Today, it's a trillion dollars. I'm not sure what they've done to increase their wealth threefold. I mean, their market cap threefold. But... And right now, it looks like Amazon and Apple are taking over the world. So, ignore these red flags if you are believing all this. And if you're not, then take these as a suggestion. We currently have the greatest concentration of wealth and decision-making in history. And that alone scares me because every time we've seen a concentration of wealth in the markets, in, in my short 35 or 37 years doing this, it's been, it's unwound ugly. But we currently, more than 87, more than 2001, more than 2008, we have the greatest concentration of wealth and decision-making ever. We have markets that have not corrected for years. We had a 5% correction, I think. I don't think we've had a 10% correction in 10 years. Or it feels like it. Maybe we have. It doesn't feel like it. We have a very flat yield curve. What that means is, and this is all over the globe. What that means is that long-term interest rates and short-term interest rates are 35 basis points apart. Many of you in this room, especially people that are my age, remember your first mortgage at maybe 17, 18, 20% if we were lucky. I remember my first mortgage, my second mortgage I got was 15.5%. I thought I stole it. Um, and short-term rates at the time were probably 7% lower. Now, there's 35 basis points. 35 basis points is one-third of 1%. So you can borrow two-year money and five-year money to 30-year money at 35 basis points. That's not normal, but it is an opportunity. We have volatility consistently 20 to 30% lower than historical norms. That means that we're looking at marketplace right now where the expected move is 20 to 30% lower. So you have a concentration of wealth, you have a concentration of decision making, you have a concentration of a few different stocks, and you have volatility down 20 to 30% across the board. That means the fear index is basically saying there should be no fear given all those characteristics. We have a record percentage, 99% of all capital that is invested today is passive. That means 99% is being controlled by a few people. 99%. We're not talking about a few trillion dollars. We're talking about, in total, probably close to $35 trillion. It's passively managed. The amount of money that's actively managed is a tiny little fraction, less than, way less than 1%. The amount of money that's strategically managed is probably close to one-tenth of one percent. One-tenth of one percent. You know why I love that? Because that means there's opportunity for every single person in this room that's willing to, to look at money, look at finance, look at strategy that way. We have record margin debt, which we always have at market tops, just like we have record low margin debt at market bottoms. But we have record margin debt. That's not something you have to just run out and say, oh my God, that's the end of the world. It's just something that we should recognize. And that is the very graceful end to my discussion.
Um, I appreciate it's been uh, it's been really great having an opportunity and all of you staying here and listening to that discussion. Actually, it's one of my most it's it's a discussion I think is one of it's fun for me because I really like this one and I am incredibly appreciative of everybody coming out here and spending you know a Saturday afternoon on a beautiful day in Toronto because I know how many beautiful days you get from this time of year on. <laughs> I can count them on one hand, right? All goes well. We will have obviously Tasty Trade. Our network is free, and anybody can watch it here. Um, Tasty Works hopefully will be. We're 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 shooting for Q1 of 2019, and I hope the next time we come back here, um, we'll have a booth. We'll be we'll have shows. We'll do all our stuff in Canada. So uh, fingers crossed, and see you next year.